All right, I think we are here. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, it took me a minute to get the stream started, but that's fine. We are here. Don't know why the latency is this bad. Uh, let's see if we can close some of my uh, million tabs. I always got like a million tabs open and that just, my computer really doesn't like me whenever I do that. But you know what, it's, 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 it's fine <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, just close everything that doesn't need to be opened at the moment and uh, hi, can everyone hear me? <laughs> if everything's okay, everyone can hear me and we have started. So let me know, yeah. In the meantime, I'll just take a sippy sip and uh, yeah, that kind of stiff. Uh. Oh, that was a good sippy sip. Let's see. Is everyone able to hear me? That would be nice. Can hear you. Perfect. Sounds great. That's all we needed to know. Now we can get started. <laughs> it's never a real stream if there are no technical difficulties. Well, so far with the new webcam with its own uh, microphone built in, everything has been very good so far. So I really cannot complain, but yeah, I mean, anything can happen. My internet can just disappear every moment now and then it's just ruined. But you know what? We shall see how everything goes. Uh, I'm excited for another live stream. Welcome, if you haven't been here before, I've uh, decided to do a monthly live stream um, this year. So every month I will do a live stream in which we will uh, take a look at the archeological discoveries that were announced in the previous month. So we just went into April and we are going to take a look at the archeological discoveries that were announced in March of 2024. So yeah, if you want to uh, support me and you don't like the fact that Patreon or YouTube usually takes a cut, um, then you can go to uh, historywithkaylee.live and you can leave a tip. And if you do so during the stream, your name and your tip will be shown on screen. So yeah, it's an extra incentive plus 100% of the proceeds go to me. So that's nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have someone I think my uh, moderators will need to have to take care of. Uh, Sean Tice, uh, you're gonna have to like uh, disappear away from my uh, channel. So I don't know who you are. I don't know what you think's going on. I have never broken the law. I've not stolen content from anyone. I've not been manipulating my uh, people for my own benefit. So uh, yeah, please disappear. If any of the mods can do that and otherwise I'm just gonna go ahead this person needs to like hide user on this channel goodbye yeah so that was fun <laughs> we already started with the guy that just out of the blue started attacking me for no reason so yay guess that's normal nowadays even in my live streams on YouTube. I mean, it's normal on Twitter and it's normal on threads and it's quite normal in my comments on YouTube, but apparently now we're gonna do that anywhere I go. So um, yeah, no, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> Thank you, Barry, for uh, getting rid of him. Anyhow, I've uh, grabbed some of the announcements of last month and uh, actually I found one that was from February that I missed. I, I'm, I'm, I'm flabbergasted as to how I have missed this one, but I mean, let's just go ahead and dive right in. So here we are. Hominins may have left Africa 700,000 years earlier than we thought. How? Did I not know about this? I just made like this entire video about the out of Africa theory in which I explain everything and I somehow missed this one? Uh, or I didn't miss it and I did include the research but I didn't see this particular article. But anyway, we're just gonna have to look at it. So yeah, 
Let's do that. Our hominin ancestors originated in Africa, and the consensus is that they didn't leave there until about 1.8 million years ago. But stone tools found in Jordan challenge the idea. So I knew about, which I mentioned in the Out of Africa video, is I knew about the fact that there were um, stone tools found in China and on the Indian subcontinent. I knew about that. So they date back to like 2.5 to 2.1 million years ago, which is already older than the, uh, the Manisi uh, remains that we found in Georgia. Uh, again, these are only tools and not hominin remains. So there is a bit of a difference. We don't know who left these tools. We do know that the entire Stone Age uh, dates back to like 3.3 million years ago and actually predates all humans because uh, the Australopithecines were actually the first to create stone tools. So yeah, stone tools were created by hominins. So the Art of Africa theory is not debunked in any way. It just shows that we left the African continent earlier than we had previously thought. So yeah, we still have all the oldest um, tangible evidence of hominin fossils that date back to Africa. They're all found in Africa. So that's really important to still note, you know, it's not that the theory entirely changed, it's just that the dates go further back. So yeah, uh, sippy sip sip, and uh, let's get reading this article. Nice uh, picture from the upper Zarka Valley in Jordan. So let's go. Uh, do we need to subscribe to stuff? Why do we need to subscribe to, what, what is this? What even is this? Like, I don't, mm. I'm annoyed already, completely annoyed. What is this stuff that we're gonna do? <sighs> I'm not gonna subscribe. It's just gonna, I'll fix this one later once. I, I, nope, 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 bye. Sorry guys, that was fun. But I'm not gonna pay for like one article. I know how much they ask for articles like that. I'm just not gonna deal with it. I'm gonna find the people who were, you know, working on the paper that was released and I'll see if I can find them and uh, have them send me the information and we'll see and we'll go from there. And I'll probably make a dedicated video on that because I'm not gonna pay uh, a lot of money for one simple article. So, next. <laughs> next. 2,000-year-old carvings of celestial bodies and animals discovered on rocky cliffs in Brazil. So, I mean, we're just gonna do this. Archaeologists identified 16 sites with representations of human footprints, animals, and celestial bodies. I mean, yeah, like, the, the, you want me to pay for your stuff? Nip, nip, mm -mm. not gonna do that. <laughs> we're just not gonna. So, yeah, I'm gonna take another sippy sip and then uh, we can... Uh, Dive right in. Let's go. Brazilian archaeologists have discovered a vast number of 2,000-year-old rock carvings that depict human footprints, celestial body-like figures, and representations of animals such as deer and wild pigs. The discovery was made during three expeditions between 2022 and 2023 in Yalapau State Park, located in the state of Tocantins, and researchers with Brazil's National Institute of Historic and Artistic Heritage identified 16 pre-colonial archaeological sites, all located on rocky cliffs close to each other. This proximity suggests a possible connection between the sites and clarifies settlement patterns of the ancient communities that inhabited the region. Romulo Macedo, the archaeologist who led the work, told Life Science via WhatsApp. I mean, awesome. Apparently, we're now going to just ask archaeologists to give their phone numbers for news outlets and then have them talk to you through WhatsApp. Yeah, that's the, the WhatsApp part of that was just weird a little bit to me. <laughs> Sorry. Like, what? Why did you feel the need to mention that? Why? <laughs> Uh, I talked to uh, this archaeologist through uh, 
Tinder, like what? If WhatsApp, like what? <laughs> Snapchat, that just doesn't make any sense. Like why they felt the need to mention that beyond me. Many of the new found carvings are engraved symbols created by wearing out rocks. The team also discovered a handful of red paintings at some of the sites. It is likely that the paintings are older than the engravings and that they were made by another cultural group. Awesome. So uh, yeah, here you can see some of the stuff that they have found, which is cool. The rock art finding is rare and important because until now, archaeologists had found only stone artifacts from the pre-colonial indigenous people of Jalapayo. Um, Marcos Zimmerman, an archaeology professor at the Federal University of Tocantins in Brazil, was not involved in the recent findings, told Life Science via WhatsApp once again. Like what? He didn't have Snapchat? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what? The earlier ceramic artifacts and stone tools found at the archaeological sites in Jalapayo may have been important items for producing art. The engravings were probably made using pointed stones and pieces of wood, while the painting pigments were produced by the pulverization of iron minerals very abundant in the region. The powder was then mixed with animal or vegetal fat and applied to the rock using fingers or sticks. Really cool. Here we can see more of this uh, the rock carvings, like the carving of the rock. It looks really cool though, like the carvings are nice. Very nice actually. Um, continue. The findings in Jalapayo have yet to be fully studied. However, they have technical and thematic similarities with other archaeological sites in different states of Brazil, which suggests the rock art dates to around 2000 years ago. Further analysis of rock art and archaeological excavations at the site will provide new information about the way of life and spirituality of these indigenous groups, he said. The findings may also shed light on the symbolic repertoire of pre-colonial populations, Macedo added. Jalapayo State Park covers an area of about 13,000 square miles, which is 34,000 square kilometers, and is an arid area with dunes, rivers, and giant rock formations, making it stand out amongst the surrounding Cerrado bio biome, 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 whatever, a unique tropical savanna for its biodiversity. It lies about 430 to 5. Blah. I can't speak. It lies about 430 to 500 miles, which equates to 700 to 800 kilometers south of the Amazon rainforest. However, archaeological work in Jalapayo has been scar scarce and has focused primarily on salvage archaeology studies prompted by agricultural or infrastructural developments, Zimmerman said. Some parts of the state have yielded artifacts dating to between 425 and 12,000 years ago, including ceramics and arrowheads, noted Zimmerman, who also served as the general coordinator of research at the Tocantins Archaeology Center. Uh, despite the significance of these discoveries, the park faces threats such as erosion, vandalism, and deforestation. IPHAN has announced plans to collaborate with research institutions to develop projects to preserve and disseminate the region's archaeological heritage. Sandstone, along with environmental factors like wind and sun, degrades rock paintings, Zimmerman add, added, said, whatever, he said, he said that. So yeah, this is uh, really cool rock art. I, I very much like that. So yeah. Hello, Tom Crown, one of my friends. Always nice when uh, some of your friends just jump in your chat and say hi. Always nice. So yeah, um, let's see what else do we have. Next story. So we're going to do this. This was almost a video on my channel. And uh, I came very close to making this as a video because I very much like the subject. It's uh, compelling, but I was unsure. So, oh, hey. Um, hmm. I need to do some moderator work later tonight. Fun, 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 fun. 
things happen. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Myth meets reality. Archaeological finds support Amazon existence. And we don't mean like the Amazon as in the rainforest in South America. We mean the Amazon women, the warrior women from Greek legends. So I'll let that sink in for like two seconds, because uh, yeah, another Greek myth slash legend might actually be true. What? That's cool. Very cool. So let's dive right in. This is actually a Belgian article, which is written in Belgian, but like it's Flanders, Belgian. So it's actually just written in like Dutch, but then some words are different. Like 99% of it is like in Dutch because Flanders Belgian is like 99% Dutch. But I translated the article in English so that you guys can read along with me, uh, which I thought was gonna be uh, very nice of me to do for all of you. I mean, I'm a nice person. So, uh, yeah, let's jump in. So here we have a depiction of one of the Amazonian warrior women. Uh, you can see of the horse, you can see the woman, you can see her spear and a lion that is uh, attacking her horse. So uh, I don't know why the lion is being such a bitch, but <laughs> shit happens. <laughs> Excavations of Bronze Age tombs in Azerbaijan have found female archers showing signs of fierce fighting. It suggests that the Amazons, a mythical people of feared and formidable female warriors from Greek legends, really existed, writes the Guardian. I really, really, really like this discovery. Um, like I said, I came this close to making a video on this particular subject. So, yeah, I actually started the script already. And uh, I quit the script after about 200 words. And I don't know why, it just didn't feel right. So instead of making this into a video, I've decided to make a video on the Bosnian pyramids. Am I happy with this decision? As you can see on my face, no. Because my fact or fiction playlist is not necessarily my favorite to uh, work on. Mostly because I don't really like the theories that are covered in uh, BS and poop. Because that's what they are to me. But yeah, let's um, continue. Oh, hi, Mythical Ireland, Anthony. We still need to email each other for that one video that we are going to work on together. So uh, I keep forgetting. I'll put it in my calendar as we speak, because otherwise I'm going to forget it again. Uh, I'm blonde. It happens. <laughs> I'll put it in my calendar for tomorrow and I'll send you an email and we can work out uh, our um, collaboration. So yeah, no, I said Bosnian pyramids, not Germans. That doesn't make any sense. All right, continue with the article. According to those legends, the Greek legends, uh, Hercules had to obtain the magical belt from Amazon queen Hippolyte during one of his 12 missions. Achilles then killed another queen, Penthesilea, only to fall in love with her when her beautiful face emerged from her helmet. These horse-riding, bow-wielding nomads who fought and hunted like men were long shrouded in mystery, but archaeologists are discovering more and more evidence that they really existed. Excavations of graves in a Bronze Age necropolis in Azerbaijan have now found women buried with weapons such as razor-sharp arrowheads, a bronze dagger and club, and jewelry. The archaeologists concluded that they could have been Amazon women who lived 4,000 years ago. According to British historian Bethany Hughes, like she's the goat next to Alice Roberts, they are my two queens when it comes to history, it shows that there is truth behind the myths and legends of ancient Greece. According to her, this evidence must be linked to previous finds. In 2019, remains of four female warriors were found in Russia. 
buried with arrowheads and spears. In 2017, Armenian archaeologists unearthed the remains of a woman who appeared to have died from battle wounds. There was an arrowhead stuck deep in her legs. In the early 1990s, the remains of a woman with a dagger were found near the border with Kazakhstan. Some skeletons reveal that the women used bows and arrows extensively. Hughes notes, their fingers are warped and such changes in the finger joints are certainly not only due to hunting. This is due to long-term and in intensive use of a bow and arrow. Also interesting, many of the bones, especially those of the pelvis, prove that they really spent a lot of time in the saddle. Hughes further noted that the jewelry also includes carnelian necklaces. Carnelian is a semi-precious stone, very popular with high priestesses and goddesses. They point out that the women had a certain status. The finds will be revealed in a new series on Channel 4 in April, entitled Bethany Hughes, Treasures of the World. Slowly you get these brilliant pieces of evidence coming out of the earth, says Hughes. That's how it often goes with the best stories. So uh, I can highly recommend if you can get Channel 4 and you can watch Bethany Hughes Treasures of the World this month because it's releasing this month. I highly recommend you do that because she's incredible. Like she and Alice Roberts are truly my two favorite people in the entire world when it comes to history and they are absolutely the queens of it. Uh, I can only hope one day I'll be slightly as good as them. Like, like I want to be 10% of the, their amazingness. Uh, that's something I strive for because they're incredible. Just like Dr. Jane Goodall. It, it's something that I look up to and I know that I'll never be able to attain it, but I can strive for it. That's all uh, everything I do. So yeah, this is uh, really cool. What else do we have today? Like this, uh, I, I still like this story. This is one of my favorites. Uh, also really like this depiction of the Amazonian warrior woman. Um, what else do we have? Do we have some fun questions? No. Was there a culture nomadic or sedentary saddle? Huh? No idea what that means exactly. English is not my first language, so I don't completely know everything, but uh, yeah. All right, Bethany Hughes, yeah, like she's like, along with Alice Roberts, I mean, this is my favorite book of Alice Roberts. It's Evolution, the Human Story. Uh, I really, really, really love Bethany Hughes. She has such a nice way of just pulling you into the story and you cannot let go. Like my attention, Span usually is like bad. I like my phone. I turn on a TV show that I've watched 10 times already and 90% of it, I'm going to be on my phone. Attention span of like what? A goldfish? <laughs> no, goldfishes have better attention spans than me, probably. But yeah, um, Bethany Hughes and Alice Roberts, whenever they start talking, I drop everything. And I can, I can only listen. Like, I don't even think about my phone because they have such a compelling way of pulling me into history and wanting to... I, I, I just want to learn more. So I can't click away. I can't walk away. If I have an appointment, but I'm watching Bethany Hughes, I'm going to be late. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm just going to be completely and utterly lit because I cannot stop watching. Unless, of course, my boyfriend is smart enough when he's at home and he's noticing that, hey, you're going to be late and then he turns it off. And then I can be like, what? Why did, why, why did you do that? But hey, thanks. I'm going to run. So he's very nice. <laughs> he takes good care of me. So we have another one of our articles. Continue, continue. I'll, uh, Make it big, because that's going to be nice. Colorful paintings of daily life uncovered in a 4,300-year-old Egyptian tomb. Again, this was almost a video as well. But it's what, what people uh, often uh, forget is the fact that 
most of the archaeological discoveries that will be announced are going to be very short articles. So like it's going to be a read of a minute, maybe two or three, depending on how fast you read, of course. I personally read extremely fast, so a three minute article for most is going to be like a one minute article for me. To try and morph that into a video of at least eight minutes in length, it's nearly impossible. Even in my style where I put in way too much background information, because I know I do that, if I want to make a quick video it's going to be at least eight minutes long. Um, it's, uh, so most of these discoveries in the past few years I have not put on my channel, which is why I decided to do these monthly live streams so that we can at least cover the stories and give them some of the attention that they do really deserve because it's a shame if no one really hears about it, if no one talks about it. So that's why I decided to start doing these live streams and uh, it's just me talking. Thankfully, I can talk a lot. It's part of who I am. I'm actually the quiet one in my family. Think about that for a second. Like me, my mom and my two sisters, my mom will talk the most out of everyone, without a doubt. Then we have my uh, middle sister, who's the paleontologist with the pink hair. She can talk the most from like my mom's kids. Um, then we have my oldest sister who can talk a lot about like her kids and her stuff and her life. And then we have me. And according to everyone who knows me in real life, they say I talk a lot. Yeah, so that's fun. But even with my incredible with talking way too much skills, I cannot turn a one to two minute article read into an eight minute video. Like, I cannot perform that kind of magic. It's a shame. I'm sorry. I'll try and do better. But yeah, so uh, I decided to put this one in the live stream and go over with it, uh, go over it with all of you. Laugh. I'm uh, babbling. So continue. Colorful paintings of daily life in ancient Egypt have been discovered in a tomb dating back more than 4,300 years. The tomb, known as a mastaba, was found in the pyramid necropolis of Dashur, about 40 kilometers south of Cairo. So I do know that... Whoa, go away. I have this article as well about it, but as you can see, it's super short. I knew that I accidentally had this one double, but that's fine. Uh, Dashur is the southern, oh sorry, the tomb known as uh, about 40 kilometers south of Cairo during a recent Egyptian-German archaeological mission. Dashur is the southernmost of the great pyramid necropolises of the Old Kingdom in the vicinity of the ancient capital of Memphis. The main attractions there are two large pyramids of King Snefru, the so-called Bent Pyramid and the Red Pyramid. I've seen both. I've not been inside both. I've not been inside either. Uh, I had the option of going inside both in 2022, but my body after nearly five weeks of being in Egypt was completely shutting down. Uh, I've got ankylosing spondylitis, which means that I have a rheumatic disease, which is also an inflammatory disease, which is also <laughs> an autoimmune disease, and it's a form of arth arthritis. It's not fun. Like, if I am not careful enough, my entire spine, my neck, and my ribcage will uh, fuse together, making me unable to move my body. So, um, Let's not do that. But yeah, back in 2022, I had the option of going into the Bent Pyramid and the Red Pyramid. Both are really, really very difficult to get into. So um, even though I had the option, at the time I was not working out. I had no idea that I had this disease. I only knew that my body was not in a great shape and I was really uh, in a lot of pain. So I didn't go inside either, um, but 
if I am going to Egypt again in the future, I will most definitely go inside both. So yeah, I will definitely go inside both. I do know that one of the two, I don't, I'm not sure if that's the bent or the red pyramid, but one of the two has a inner chamber with a lot of bats and the other one has an inner chamber where people apparently peed a lot. So it smells of urine badly. But you know what? It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Barry, my uh, moderator here, Barry Walser, he was with me in Egypt when I was there in 2022. And he has been inside, I think, both of them. And yeah, he had the best of time. He had the best of times and he loved it. And it was really difficult, but I think he enjoyed going into both of them. So uh, yeah, he probably will forgive me for not having joined him. <laughs> Please forgive me, Barry. <laughs> but yeah, let's continue with the article. Made from unfired mud brick, the rectangular mastaba measures about 8 meters by 12 meters and features seven burial shafts, as well as another shaft for ceramic bowls and other items used in burial rituals. According to inscriptions on a massive limestone false door, the tomb belonged to a man named Seneb Nebeth, who served in the administration of the residents of the palace district as well as his wife Idut. The shape of the mastaba, together with the inscriptions, images, and ceramics found inside, suggests that it dates from the end of the 5th or the beginning of the 6th dynasty, approximately 2300 BCE. Stefan Seidelmeier, former director of the German Archaeological Institute in Berlin, led the expedition. He told CNN in an email, which already sounds so much more professional compared to in a WhatsApp conversation, on WhatsApp, like in the whole on WhatsApp thing from the previous article, just why? Why mention that? Just lie and say it wasn't in an email or something. It sounds a lot more professional. Come on. Come on. Work on the professionalism. She says while wearing a bright red shirt and sitting in her office drinking an al alcoholic beverage during a live stream. I'm really not one to speak, am I? <laughs> Oops, <laughs> sorry. Mm. But this cider is nice though. He told CNN in an email, the corridor and the cold chamber were decorated with subtle paintings on mud plaster, a rarity in the necropolis of Dashur. Despite extensive destruction, numerous images have been preserved. They show pictures of the tomb owner and his wife in front of the offering table. Scenes from daily life, donkeys on the threshing floor, ships on the Nile, a marketplace and servants who bring gifts for the mortuary cult. In their elegant forms and perfect execution, the pictures offer valid evidence of the artistic milieu of the capital region of the developed Old Kingdom. So this word, milieu, is also a Dutch word. Uh, I know it comes from French and it means like environment. I don't know why this was, oh yeah, it's a CA, I see. It's a Canadian, it's a Canadian article. Like that explains everything because the Canadians of course will use French words. <laughs> Just like Dutch people have been using French words a lot because, you know, the French um, went to war with us and then stole Belgium. Or at least the land that nowadays is Belgium, because that used to be part of the Netherlands long ago, before the uh, Napoleonic Wars, I think. Yeah, around that time. So, yeah. Oh, hey, Dirt Diggers UK. Welcome. Welcome. Hi there again. Good to see you too. All right, continue. According to a statement from the Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and, and Antiquities, inscriptions reveal that the owner of the tomb held several positions in the royal palace in the administration of tenants, while his wife held the titles of Priestess of Hathor and Lady of the Sycamore. Priestess of Hathor is one of the highest titles a noble woman could have in ancient Egypt. So that really is massive. 
The German Archaeological Institute Cairo has been excavating at Dashur since 1976. The initial stage is focused on the pyramids of King Senefru from the Old Kingdom and King Amenhemat for the third Amenhemat the third from the Middle Kingdom. Like Amenhemat the third, his name is one of the most difficult names for me to pronounce. I don't know why, always had an issue with it. More recent excavations have, however, centered on the tombs of great statesmen, priests and administrators from the same eras. Seidelmeyer and his team will continue to excavate the site in an attempt to search for more secrets of this area. The Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities said in its statement, and it added, cleaning and documentation work will be carried out on the tomb and its inscriptions during the coming period. Um, if most of you people are aware, the current excavation season in Egypt is almost coming to a close because the heat is returning in the Egyptian lands. Um, yeah, Egypt is incredibly hot. Like, it's insane how hot it can get. Um, I've been to Hurghada, which is along the Red Sea, uh, near Lower Egypt in the north. I've been there in June three times. I've been there while it was 42 degrees Celsius during the day. That's hot. And then you're still lucky because you're that close to the Red Sea, so you have the wind constantly blowing on your body, which cools you down just a tad. I've also stood in the middle of the Egyptian desert in June. It was 56 degrees Celsius. I'm not sure if everyone knows how much that is in Fahrenheit, so I'm going to see. 56 Celsius to Fahrenheit. 132.8 degrees Fahrenheit. I stood in the Egyptian desert with that temperature. And that was in the morning. It was before noon that it had already hit that temperature in the middle of the desert. And there is no wind in the middle of the desert to keep you cool. So we were at a Bedouin camp and the Bedouins for that day, because it was so hot, were like absolutely doing nothing. I rode a camel at nine in the morning. They brought us to their well because Bedouins are known for creating a well and then they built their camp around it and once they see that the well is dried up to like nearly halfway, uh, they will send a kid with uh, a camel or they will send a camel to search for water and then when the camel returns they will send a seven or eight year old boy with the camel into the middle of the desert um, to find water and when the camel stomps on a location with its hind legs it means that the camel has found underground water so the boy will then mark that position return with the camel to the camp the already existing camp and then they will bring men with them to the location that was marked by the boy where the camel said that there would be underground water and they will start digging and create a new well. Uh, the creation of a well can take quite a long time. Uh, so once it's finished, the old well that was halfway to the halfway point, like halfway empty by the time that they sent the camel out in the first place, the the, that well will be nearly completely dry by the time that the new well is done building. And then they will change and like they will pack up their entire camp and they will change location from the old well to the new well. And then they have a new Bedouin camp that will last them for another three years or so, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. It all depends on how much water they were 
finding, but it's incredibly hot in the middle of the desert. I do not know how these Bedouins are able to survive that, but they, they are. And it's incredible, and I've seen it, I've experienced it. The water from the well is as cold as it would come straight from, like, my refrigerator. It's not frozen like a freezer, but it's extremely cold, especially compared to like the heat that you're standing in. So what these Bedouins did, because they their well was already halfway dry when we arrived at their camp, they had already found a new source of water. The men were already started, uh, had already started digging for the new well in the new location. So they knew they would have sort of a surplus of water, so they offered to share more of their water with us because we had bottles of water with us, but you really can't keep them cool for long enough in the middle of the desert at 54, 55, 56 degrees Celsius. It's just, it, it almost evaporates from your bottle. It's insane. So they would fill our bottles with the water from the well and they would get buckets from the well and ask us if we wanted in our necks, if we wanted on our wrists, on our ankles, cool down our feet, uh, our temples, uh, everything that we wanted to cool down, they did. And these people were like godsend, absolutely. They were the nicest and uh, for me it was... A surreal experience to be treated like a queen in the middle of the desert by people who had really not much to offer but they offered the most valuable thing on this planet which is fresh drinkable water that was ice cold <laughs> so yeah uh just wanted to share that story with you don't know why i'm like this but i am like this so we will continue with the articles and uh, yeah, this uh, this fun. <laughs> you heard a little bit about my experience in the Egyptian desert, which was really cool. I liked it. Another article that almost turned into a video is this one. Archaeologists on a 3,000 year old stilt village frozen in time. This was announced on March 24, 2024. <laughs> bit you didn't expect that. The 2024 bit of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have not seen any of my mods be out of control. I've also seen all your uh, replies, Ignatius. And uh, if I'm going to be honest, it's a lot. I've already responded to you a few times. And at this point, there's not much I can do besides let you talk. Sorry. Like, I've been respectful to you. I've answered some of your questions. I've given some information. And you keep the same narrative. You reply a lot. Like, you leave uh, dozens of comments on one video all in the same fashion all saying that certain things I said aren't the truth, even though I very much did my research. So, yeah. And everyone can see your posts, really. Everyone can see it. No one is hiding you. No one is doing anything to you. Not at all. So, sorry. I'm going to continue with this article. All right? All right. Let's go. A major report on the... Rem that, that went fine. That went perfectly fine. Let's con try that again. A major report on the remains of a stilt village that was engulfed in flames almost 3,000 years ago reveals in unprecedented detail the daily lives of England's prehistoric Fenlanders. What? is a Fenlander. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued now. Like, I've not heard this term. What is a Fenlander? An inhabitant of the Fenlands. All right. Definitions of Fenland, low-lying wetland with grassy 
Grassy vegetation usually is a transition zone between land and water. Oh, you mean like the entirety of the Netherlands? Cool. Finland. Eastern England. Oh, that makes sense, actually. Oh, look. Doggerland area. Look. Oh, yeah. Ah, that makes sense. Doggerland area. Of course, it would be similar to that of the Netherlands. Ah, of course, that, that says it all. Ignatius, I have actually responded to some of your questions directly, especially in the day after the Out of Africa Migrations uh, video uh, premiered. I saw seven of your replies that day and I responded to two of them directly. And then after that, I honestly gave up. Because there's not much I can say after having responded and getting the same questions in a different format constantly. Uh, yes, I am aware that there were hominins in Europe, or like hominids, sorry, in Europe during the Miocene. I've covered them in videos. I've covered Danuvius Gugamosi and I've covered Dryopithecus. No, I have not covered Grysopithecus freibergi yet. I'm still working on that. But I've also decided not to cover Grysopithecus freibergi for a while because the videos I did make on the great apes from Europe during the Miocene really flunked. They really did not perform well. And at this point in time, I'd like to be able to pay my bills. So that means I need to make videos that people want to watch and that will perform well. And Grysopithecus Freibergi at this point in time is not a video I can make that will make me enough money so that I can keep paying my bills. So please, <laughs> stop with the same seven type of comments that you keep sending. I've responded already. I'm responding to you right now, once again, and there's not much I can do. Yes, you are a channel member, but that doesn't mean that you're above anyone else. We're all people and we're all just living life and we're all doing our best. <laughs> But it's not fine and it's not okay when I'm trying to do a live stream about all of these other different subjects and archaeological discoveries that were announced last month and I keep having to do this. Let me please do my thing and I will let you and everyone else in the chat do your thing. Okay? Thank you. So yeah, the east of England used to be connected with the rest of Europe through Doggerland. I don't have the Doggerland book behind me. I'm gonna cry. I also don't have my sister's book behind me at this point in time. I've given them to my mother-in-law to have, because she wanted to read them. So I don't have them. I can not show them like I normally would, um, <laughs> which isn't fun, but it's fine. Um, but yeah, Doggerland, I made a video on Doggerland and uh, I highly recommend watching it if you haven't seen it already. It's like one of my best videos. It's a mini documentary, as I call it. Um, the thumbnail looks awesome. I can show it here. YouTube history with Kaylee Doggerland. Oh, look at that. Won't you look at that? That's me. That's my video. It's about 30 minutes long. It's really cool. It's awesome. I highly recommend watching it. I give you the outline of Doggerland, what animals and humans we found there uh, and used to live there and the reason why it disappeared. So yay, Doggerland. Awesome. Highly recommend. Must Farm, a late Bronze Age settlement, dates to around 850 BC, with University of Cambridge archaeologists unearthing four large wooden roundhouses and a square entranceway structure, all of which had been constructed on stilts above a slow-moving river. I think that's genius, especially in a marshy land, in a marshy environment where you really cannot built on the land itself because it will sink. In the Netherlands, almost all of the buildings that you see 
especially in the west of the country and the north, so everything near the coast, Every building that you see ha is built on stilts in the Netherlands. It's just that the stilts are going way deep into the ground until we find like a sand layer and this layer of sand, that's where we will, that will be like the foundation of our stilts. And then the stilt will be long enough to go back to the surface. And then on the surface, on those stilts, we will built the foundation and then we built the rest of the building. This is also the reason why in the Netherlands we in general do not have basements. Like in the States, almost every house has basements. In the Netherlands we do not have this because the ground will shift because it's marshy ground. So we built on stilts and yeah, the house I currently sit in, built on stilts. The foundation of this is built on stilts. We find the good, sandy, thick, hard layer in the, like deep in the ground. It can be like at, as deep as like 30 meters. So uh, 30 meters to feet, uh, it's almost 100 feet deep sometimes where we find that good layer, that solid, we call it sand, but compared to like the marsh land, which we can like, I don't know if you know, but like marshy ground, you can squeeze, you can squish that, like put it in a bucket. You can actually squish that down and make it more dense because you know, it's marshy clay. It's, it's marshy BS soil. You need good sand for it to become rigid enough to place buildings on top of it. So yeah, that's what we do. Oh yeah, we they call them piles. Like it, it, uh, they have many names, I think nowadays, but yeah, it's sort of like a stilt. Like this, it's the same idea as building on stilts. So yeah, like Amsterdam, the entire city of Amsterdam is built on stilts. People don't know this, but like it's, the bedrock is deep and like bedrock. Like I said, like it's nearly a hundred feet deep at most places. So like that's bedrock. It's not even rock. It's not even bedrock. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's fine. Uh, we're used to it. The entire hamlet stood approximately two meters above the riverbed with walkways bridging some of the main houses and was surrounded by a two meter high fence of sharpened posts. The settlement was less than a year old when it was destroyed by a catastrophic fire with buildings and their contents collapsing into the muddy river below. The combination of charring and waterlogging led to exceptional preservation and this site has been described as Britain's Pompeii. So I will let you look at this intact hafted axe that had been placed in the silt directly beneath st structure one, perhaps a token of good fortune or an offering to some kind of spirit on completion of the build. That axe looks absolutely magnificent. It's fantastic. <clears throat> absolutely fantastic. So yeah. Let's uh, continue reading. Years of research conducted on thousands of artifacts from the site have now shown that early fen folk had surprisingly comfortable lifestyles with domestic layouts similar to modern homes, meals of honey glazed venison, clothes of fine flax linen, and even a recycling bin. Damn, that's nice. The settlement on stilts is also contained uh, also contained a stack of spears with shafts over three meters long, as well as a necklace with beads from as far away as Denmark and Iran, and a human skull rendered smooth by touch, perhaps a memento of a lost loved one. So, Henrik, we, we mentioned Denmark. Denmark has entered the chat. <laughs> Henrik, my moderator at TSCHT uh, or something. I, I keep forgetting, like, what, what, what is it? 
I, I, why do I always flunk on your username, Henrik? Let me see. What what is it? It's um. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's quickly. T S C T H. I think I actually said it right. <laughs> Perfect. But uh, yeah, T S C T H. That's uh, my my good friend Henrik, and he is a Dane, and he is from Denmark. Really cool. So yeah, Denmark has entered the chat. Uh, the Cambridge archaeologists say that the site provides a unique blueprint for the circular architecture, home interiors, and overall domestici domesticity of those who inhabited the swampy fenland of East Anglia some eight centuries before Romans set foot on British shores. Full findings from the must farm fight must farm site <laughs> excavated in by the Cambridge Archaeological Unit in 2015 to 2016, after its discovery on the edge of the Whittle Sea near Peterborough, are published in two reports, both made available by Cambridge's Macdonald Institute for Archaeological Research. Here we can see a member of the Cambridge Archaeological Unit on site at the Must Farm excavation in 2016, who displays a pot recovered from the kitchen area of one of the roundhouses. Like, really cool, that pot is perfectly intact. Super cool. Really awesome. So yeah, that's cool. Uh, I am going to take a very, 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 very quick bathroom break because hello, have you met me? I'll be right back. I'm a woman, I'm drinking because I'm speaking a lot. So we need to pee, like it happens. I'll be back in like a minute or two and uh, then we will continue because we still have one, two, three, four, five, six articles to go. Awesome. So, I'll see you in a minute. And we are back. Ta -da 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 -da. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I hope I wasn't away for too long. Uh, again, if you uh, want your name on the screen with like subscribing or becoming a channel member or with a donation, especially that last bit, uh, if you want to leave a donation, go to historywithkaylee.live and uh, yeah, you can. Uh, 
donate an amount that you feel comfortable with and 100% of it goes to me. Patreon and YouTube do not take a cut. It will be sent directly to me. So yeah, I uh, just wanted to say this uh, real quick. <laughs> but yeah, we are back. We are going to uh, watch the Must Farm uh, article and uh, let's go. The people were confident and accomplished home builders. They had a design that worked beautifully for an increasingly drowned landscape, said Mark Knight, report co-author and excavation director. While excavating the site, there was a sense that its Bronze Age residents had only just left. You could almost see and smell their world, from the glint of metal tools hanging on wattled walls to the sharp milkiness of brewed porridge. The ruins of five structures were uncovered, along with walkways and fencing, but the original settlement was likely twice as big. Half the site was removed by 20th century quarrying, with researchers saying it may have held up to 60 occupants in family units. The river running underneath the community would have been shallow, sluggish, and thick with vegetation. This cushioned the scorched remains where they fell, creating an archaeological mirror of what had stood above, allowing researchers to map the layout of the structures. So here you can see an, over, uh, an overview site plan of the Bronze Age settlement unearthed at Must Farm in the east of England. And I'll give you a moment to look at that. So yeah, uh, really cool. And uh, I'm excited to see what they will find at Must Farm in the future because they've been excavating at this location for such a long time. It's, interested, it's interesting to see what else they will be able to uncover because it's, as they said, a mirror of what stood above. It's really cool. Really cool. Ugh, I get a dry mouth from talking like this much. Really nice. All right, so you saw the picture and now we're going to go down. One of the main roundhouses with almost 50 square meters of floor space appeared to have distinct activity zones comparable to rooms in a modern home. Conducting research on Must Farm is a bit like getting an estate agent's tour of a Bronze Age stilt house, said G David Gibson, report co-author and archaeological manager at CAU. Ceramic and wooden containers, including tiny cups, bowls and large storage jars were found in the northeast quadrant of Structure 1, the location of a kitchen. Some pots were even nested, designed to stack inside one another to save space. Metal tools were stored along the building's eastern side, while the empty northwest area was probably reserved for sleeping. The southeast space had lots of cloth fragments, along with bobbins and loom weights. This was close to a likely entrance, where extra light would have helped with textile work. Here we can see one of the people, a member of the Cambridge Archaeological Unit, uncovering an axe head during excavations at the Must Farm site in 2016. I mean, think about this for a second. You are working on such an incredible archaeological dig site. You're excavating. And as you dig, you come across an axe head. Like, look at how awesome that looks. He, he was probably the one who discovered it, it in the first place, and he's excavating it. And you have to be very careful, but oh my god. That's exciting. That's really, really awesome. Let's continue. The roundhouse's southwest quadrant was reserved for keeping lamps indoors. There was no evidence of humans dying in the fire, but several young sheep had been trapped and burnt alive. That's really unfortunate. Those poor, poor sheep. Skeletal remains showed the lamps were three to six months old, suggesting the settlement was destroyed sometimes in the late summer or early autumn. Evidence that the wooden architecture was still green confirms construction took place around nine months to a year earlier. Household inventories were remarkably consistent. All the roundhouses contained a metalwork toolkit that included sickles, which are crop harvesting blades, 
along with axes and curved gouges used to hack and chisel wood, as well as handheld razors for cutting hair. Most buildings had objects for making textiles from spindle whorls to thread bobbins, although the distribution suggests that spinning, the process of twisting fibers together, was conducted in three of the roundhouses, but structure one was where this yarn got converted to fabrics. So here we have an illustration depicting daily life inside structure one based on the analysis of materials unearthed at the must farm excavation. I'm still leaning to possibly making a video on the must farm site because it's such an incredibly well-preserved site. The reason I haven't done it yet is because I feel like it might, it's, it's slightly on the younger side for me personally, when it comes to like my channel with like the Stone Age and the Neolithic, we've been, I cover a little bit of early Bronze Age, but you know what I mean? So my, I think I will probably make a video on it one day, but I will see, I, I first want to see what else they can uncover at this point in time. Uh, if I want to make a video, I'd like to give like the... 80 to 90% complete story. And I think at this point in time, we are between the 70 and 80% of a complete story with Must Farm. So yeah, the textiles are the finest of this period found in Europe with details such as pile tufts that would have given garments a soft and almost velvety feel and tubular selvage for neat seams and hems. Each roundhouse roof had three layers, insulating straw topped by turf and completed with clay, making them warm and waterproof, but still well ventilated. In a freezing winter, with winds, with winds cutting across the fence, these roundhouses would have been pretty cozy. Structure 4, a smaller square building, may have also acted as the settlement's entrance. A large wooden bucket had been kept within, containing several damaged bronze objects and worn axe heads, waiting to be smelted down and recycled into new tools. Encircling the footprint of each round house were middens, halos of rubbish dumped from the stilt village above, including broken pots, butchered animal bones, and coprolites, which is fossilized feces. Some human coprolites had parasite eggs, suggesting inhabitants struggled with intestinal worms, which in a marshy landscape really is something we can expect. <laughs> so yeah, for sure, really something that we can expect. There's a YouTube channel they've set up with show, which showcases some of what they found. I might actually have to get in contact with the people behind that YouTube channel and see if I can do a collaboration with them because uh, I want to show the people the awesome stuff that they have found and also showcase the entire find itself. So that could actually uh, be a good thing. I'll see if I can do that, actually. So yeah, continue, continue, continue. One item, however, had been placed in the silt directly beneath structure one an intact hafted axe that I just showed. Uh, this one, I will scroll back up a little bit for you to see it once more, the intact hafted axe. So yeah, just had to show it to you again because, uh, hello, have you seen it? It's freaking awesome. All right, continue with the story. Perhaps a token of good for fortune or an offering to some kind of spirit on completion of the build. Despite millennia in the mud, many artifacts still bore traces of daily life, along with its sudden interruption as inhabitants abandoned their possessions to escape the blaze. For example, a pottery bowl with the finger marks of its maker captured in the clay was found still holding its final meal. A wheat grain porridge mixed with animal fats, possibly goat or red deer, and the wooden spatula used for steering was resting against the inside of the bowl. So they must have left very, very abruptly. I mean, there was a fire. So yeah, very, very extremely abrupt, abruptly. Like it's a uh, run for your lives now. It appears the occupants saved their meat juices to use as toppings for porridge, said Dr. Chris Wakefield. The site is providing us with hints of recipes for Bronze Age breakfasts and roast dinners. 
Chemical analysis of the bowls and jars showed traces of honey along with ruminant meats such as deer, suggesting these ingredients were combined to create a form of prehistoric honey-glazed venison. The stilt house dwellers even had favorite cuts of meat, often bringing the forelegs of a boar back for roasting, for example, preferred aquatic dishes, including pike and bream. Several small dog skulls suggest the animals were kept domestically, perhaps as pets, but also to help flush out prey on a hunt. Dog coprolites show they fed on scraps from their owner's meals. Must farm residents used the local woodlands, evidence suggests within a two mile radius to hunt boar and deer in grazed sheep and harvest crops such as wheat and flax, as well as wood for construction. Waterways were vital for transporting all of these materials. The remains of nine log boats, canoes hollowed from old tree trunks, which I just covered in like a video mentioning 7,000 year old log boats or dugout boats or canoes, whatever you want to call them, from the Mediterranean. People were mad at me because it was found in a lake and not in the Mediterranean itself, but that lake used to be connected to the Mediterranean and we already know that they have sailed the Mediterranean with them, so I mean, come on. Uh, these boats, nine log boats, were found upstream, dating from across the bronze and into the Iron Age, included some that were contemporary to Must Farm. Boat journeys through red deer swamps to the woodlands would have been made many times during the site's short life, said Wakefield. In summer, that meant traversing clouds of mosquitoes. Much of what was retrieved from Must Farm were everyday items, the Bronze Age equivalent to the TV remotes and coffee mugs of our own lives. However, some items would have been precious. A necklace of beads made from glass, amber, siltstone and shale had been lost in the fire. In fact, decorative beads were found right across the site. All but one of Must Farm's 49 glass beads came from far-flung places, including northern and eastern Europe and even the Middle East. Such items would gradually make their way across thousands of miles in a long series of small trades. The researchers say that while the Bronze Age could be violent and aspects of the site structure are clearly defensive, its location may be as much to do with resources. Spears found on site up to 3.4 meters in length as well as swords were as likely to be used in animal hunts as on rival groups. A few human remains were recovered, including the skull of an adult woman polished by repeated touch, a sign this may have been a keepsake of love rather than war. The cause of the fire that tore through the settlement will probably never be known. Some argue it may have come under attack as the occupants never returned for their goods, which would have been fairly easy to retrieve from the shallow waters. However, others think it's more likely to have been an accident. If an internal fire took hold in one of the roundhouses, it would spread between the tight-knit structures within minutes. Added Gibson, a settlement like this would have had a shelf life, maybe a generation. And the people who had built it had clearly constructed similar sites before. It may be that after the fire, they simply started again. There is every possibility that the remains of many more of these stilted settlements are buried across Fenland, waiting for us to find them. The major 1.1 million pound excavation project was funded by Historic England and building supplier Forterra. It was carried out by Cambridge Archaeological Unit of the University of Cambridge and the remains were removed for recording and analysis due to concerns about the location and future preservation of the site. So yeah, this is uh, really nice. Very, very nice, actually. Um, I'm really excited about the Must Farm site and I think I will cover it in a video in the future, as I just said, but... Uh, yeah, that's nice. I really like it. It's a cool it's a cool settlement. Unfortunately, they didn't live here for that long, like probably less than a full year. But yeah, cool. Uh, I'm empty with this one. Thankfully, I still have like my normal water. But yeah, um, not sure if I can make all of the articles now that I'm looking at the time I have to leave in like half an hour <laughs> normally I don't have anything after a live stream but today this week has been very hacked hectic uh, yeah I've been working on my script for this weekend's video which I'm not even sure if I can upload this entire weekend like, like I might have to upload it on Monday but we will see I'll go with the next uh, article Whatever. 
Uh, this 1.6 million year old discovery that changes what we know about human evolution. New research suggests that language is eight times older than previously thought. So let's uh, make this big so I can read it. New research has pinpointed the likely time in prehistory, what's this, close, uh, when humans first began to speak. Analysis by British archaeologist Stephen Mithen suggests that early humans first developed rudimentary language around 1.6 million years ago, somewhere in the eastern, somewhere in eastern or southern Africa. Humanity's development of the ability to speak was without doubt the key which made much of, subse much of subsequent human physical and cultural evolution possible. That's why dating the emergence of the earliest forms of language is so important. Dr. Mitten, professor of early prehistory at the University of Reading, told The Independent. Until recently, most human evolution experts thought humans only started speaking around 200,000 years ago. Professor Mitten's new research, published this month, suggests that rudimentary human language is at least eight times older. His analysis is based on a detailed study of all the available archaeological, paleo, anatomical, genetic, neurological, and linguistic evidence. When combined, all the evidence suggests that the birth of language occurred as part of a suite of human evolution and other developments between 2 and 1.5 million years ago. Significantly, brain size, human brain size, increased particularly rapidly from 2 million BCE, especially after 1.5 million BCE. Associated with that brain size increase was a reorganization of the internal structure of the brain, including the first appearance of the area of the frontal lobe, specifically associated with language production and language comprehension, known to scientists as Broca's area. It seems to have evolved out of earlier structures responsible for early humanity's ability to communicate with hand and arm gestures. So this is already like really, really cool. I'm very, very intrigued here. I hope all you are as well. Continue. New scientific research suggests that the appearance of Broca's area was also linked to improvements in working memory, a factor crucial to sentence formation. But other evolutionary developments were also crucial for the birth of rudimentary language. The emergence, around 1.8 million years ago, of a more advanced form of bipedalism together with changes in the shape of the human skull almost certainly began the process of changing the shape and positioning of the vocal tract, thus making speech possible. This is also a picture of Tanzania's Olduvai Gorge. It's one of the most famous locations for its Stone Age archaeology. Uh, it might be one of the first areas where a human began to speak. Awesome! <laughs> Other key evidence pointing to around 1.6 million BCE as the approximate date humans started speaking comes from the archaeological record. Compared to many other animals, humans were not particularly strong. To survive and prosper, they needed to compensate for that relative physical weakness. This is an artistic recreation of Homo erectus. I always say homie erectus, I can't say homo erectus, I don't know why, people, I'm just like this. I, uh, yeah, yeah, homie erectus, da 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 da. All right, continue. In evolutionary terms, language was almost certainly part of that physical strength compensation strategy. In order to hunt large animals or when scavenging to repel physically strong animal rivals, Early humans needed greater group planning and coordination abilities. The development of language would have been crucial in facilitating that. Significantly, date-wise, human hunting began around 2 million years ago, but seems to have substantially accelerated by around 1.5 million years ago. Around 1.6 million BCE also saw the birth and intergenerational cultural transmission of much more sophisticated stone tool technology. That long-term transfer of complex knowledge and skills from generation to generation also strongly implies the existence of speech. So, yeah, very awesome. Um, yeah, what do you think? What do you think? Mm -hmm. What do you think? What do you think? I have one of my cats who just mm, stepped 
outside the door when I uh, went to the bathroom earlier, and one of her hairs has uh, touched my nose. And I'm actually slightly allergic to cats. Awesome. So I took two cats in my home. So my nose is now itchy as if, but we, we can continue. It's fine. It's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. What's more, linguistic communication was probably crucial in allowing humans to survive in different ecological and climatic zones. It's probably no coincidence that humans were able to massively accelerate their colonization of the world around 1.4 million years ago, i.e. shortly after the likely date of birth of language. Language enabled humans to do three key forward-looking things, to conceive of and plan future actions and to pass on knowledge. That's how language changed the human story so profoundly. Really, what? Oh, okay, this explains why the Eye of the Sahara stood here. It's like, oh, Atlantis. No, it's not Atlantis. <laughs> it's really not. Continue. Uh, his new research outlined in a new book, The Language Puzzle, published this month, suggests that before around 1.6 million years ago, humans had had a much more limited communication ability. Probably just a few dozen different noises and arm gestures, which could only be developed in specific contexts and could not, therefore, be used for forward planning. For planning, basic grammar and individual words were needed. Uh, the so-called reshot structure in the Sahara Desert, the Eye of the Sahara, was actually once a major prehistoric tool-making and hunting center for Homo erectus. So, like, that's why I'm always laughing when people say it's like, oh, it's the remains of Atlantis. No, it's not. It's not Atlantis. It's never been Atlantis. It's a hub where people would come together and create stone tools and then hunt animals. And Homo erectus did that. I, I, I said Homo erectus again. Homo erectus did that. And um, we know for for certain that Homo sapiens, our own species of modern humans, uh, also created stone tools there and used that site for hunting, which is really cool. Fire dates back to around 1.2 to 1.4 million years ago by Homo erectus that we know for sure. So yeah, really cool. Ah, it's like annoying. My ah, ah, it's so itchy. Nim, nim, nim. Annoying! Don't have cats when you're allergic to cats. It sounds so logical, but still, it's like... I took cats inside my home, and um, yeah. It's whatever. Professor Mitten's research also suggests that there appears to be some continu continuity between very, very early human languages and modern ones. He believes that, remarkably, some aspects of that first linguistic development 1.6 million years ago still survive in modern languages today. He is proposing that words, which, through their sounds or length, describe the objects they stand for, were almost certainly among the first words uttered by early humans. Not really sure about that. That sounds a little bit far-fetched, because as we look at all these different languages that we are using and their origins, the origin languages all have very different sounds for the same things. So like in English, this is a chair, but in Dutch it's stool. You also have stools in English, but that's more like a bar stool which in Dutch is like a bar kruk. You see what I mean? Like there's many differences. So, and that's just like English and Dutch actually have the same origins in like Germanic languages. So what? Okay. Continue, continue, continue. Um, Indeed, future research may be able to tentatively recreate the likely organization and structure of those first languages, although the birth of language seems to have occurred around 1.6 million years ago. That birth represented the beginning of linguistic development, not its culmination. 
For hundreds of thousands of years, language only very gradually became more complex, ultimately gaining in sophistication after the emergence of anatomically modern humans 150,000 years ago. Really cool article. Very nice. Let's continue. Archaeologists find 6,000-year-old mounds containing wooden grave chambers. Archaeologists from the State Office for Heritage Management and Archaeological Archaeology Saxony Anhalt have uncovered a burial landscape from the Neolithic period on the Uhlenberg near Magdeburg in Germany. Excavations have revealed two 6,000-year-old mounds from the Baalberger group, 4,100 to 3,600 BCE, a late Neolithic a late Neolithic culture that inhabited central Germany and Bohemia. According to a statement by the LDA, the mounds were constructed on top of grave chambers where the archaeologists have found several burials. Both chambers are trapezoidal in shape, measuring from between 20 and 30 meters in length. Almost a millennia later, the area in between the mounds was used as a processional route for sacrifices and burials by people from the globular amphora culture, the GAC. These later people constructed a 50 centimeter wide palisade ditch between the mounds to demarcate the processional route which passed over several cattle burials. The GAC had a tradition of using animal parts such as pig's jaws or even whole animals as grave offerings with other examples of entire cattle burials found at other GAC sites across Central Europe. Speaking to Heritage Daily, a representative of the LDA said, Along this path, pairs of young, two to three year old cattle were sacrificed and buried. In one case, the grave of a 35 to 40 year old man was dug in front of the cattle burials, creating the image of a cart with a driver or a plow pulled by cattle. Really cool. So, um, yeah, nice. In the vicinity, archaeologists also found several corded ware culture bur burial mounds that date from around 2800 to 2050 BCE. The corded ware culture was a late Neolithic and early Copper Age people that is considered to be a likely vector for the spread of many of the Indo-European languages in Europe and Asia. There we go, languages again. Like I said, like Dutch, English, uh, Swedish, all the Scandinavian languages, uh, German, we all have the same origins of language and it, it all goes back to like the Germanic, the Indo-European languages, the Germanic tribes, all that stuff. According to the researchers, the archaeological evidence indicates that the landscape remained an important ceremonial center for prehistoric people over a long period of time. So I really enjoyed this really quick short article. Um, it's cool. I like Heritage Daily for the fact that they give me Lots of these short articles. Uh, <laughs> I could like send this to the chat, but uh, no one's going to be able to read it because uh, you need to know German. Do you know German? I don't know German. So that's yeah, fine. We can go to the next of this. All right. Ah. Uh. All right, all right, all right. I need to sneeze soon. Uh, I don't want to sneeze, but I'm gonna have to. And I'm back. So yeah, um, I don't go and sneeze on camera, especially not when it's like an allergic type of sneeze. It's, uh, you know, we do things that we share with people and then there are things that I do not share with people and I do not share the way I sneeze. So yeah, every time I feel like I'm gonna have to sneeze, I'm gonna have to like do the be right back screen and uh, yeah, awesome. So I wanted to give this um, article some time. Um, why did I decide on that? It has to do with the countries 
or the country that we're going to talk about. Curaçao. Curaçao is actually part of the Netherlands, even though it is located in the Caribbean. Curaçao. Where is it located? Uh, here, on the map. Beep, 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 beep. Look, Venezuela, Cuba, Haiti. It's uh, the Caribbean islands and all that stuff. The Caribbean Sea even, with Haiti and the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico above it, and Cuba, and Colombia and all that stuff. It's uh, very far away from the Netherlands. It used to be part of the Dutch Kingdom a long time ago. Um, do I agree with all the stuff that went down and how all of that happened and whatever? Um, no, but you know, I can't help the fact that that did happen. So it's located all the way there. The Netherlands is, uh, as you know, located in the Netherlands. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't. Uh, the Netherlands is located around here, where the mouse is currently pointing, while Curaçao is located there. All right, awesome. Used to be a Dutch colony, um, part of the Dutch kingdom. It's an island. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Yes, I am Dutch. Um, it's always known, like I'm very open about the fact that I am Dutch. It's uh, in my about section and I mentioned that I'm Dutch at least like once a day. <laughs> I think at least, but yeah, born and raised in the Netherlands, in North Holland, it's fun. But this article, study rewrites history of human settlement on Curaçao. A study co-led by Simon Fraser University and the National Archaeological Anthropological Memory Management has rewritten the history of Curaçao by extending the earliest known human settlement by centuries. So let that sink in for a moment. What? Curaçao is an island and constituent country of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in the Southern Caribbean Sea in the Dutch Caribbean region. The first inhabitants of the island were the Arawak and the, Cachet, the Caqueto Amerindians, who were ancestors likely, whose ancestors likely migrated from the mainland of South America. The first Europeans to the islands were members of the Spanish expedition led by Alonso de Olleda in 1499. Most of the native islanders were enslaved to work as labor in uh, the Spanish colo colony on Hispaniola with all the remainder islanders transported as slaves in 1550. Like I said, I don't agree with how all of that went down. In a recent study published in the Journal of Coastal and Island Archaeology, archaeologists have determined that Curaçao was first settled as far back as 5735 to 5600 BCE, up to 850 years earlier than previously thought. Uh, this is actually before present, sorry. Uh, so, less than 6000 years ago. The revised timeline was established through radiocarbon dating of charcoal found at an archaic period site situated at Salinia Sint Marie. Cristina Giovas, an associate professor in SFU's Department of Archaeology, said, What this new information does is push the initial exploration in this region back to a time where other islands to the north of Curaçao are also being settled. This suggests that the movement of people from the continental mainland into those more northern islands might have entangled with some of the movement of the people into Curaçao. According to a press statement by SFU, the team plans to return to Curaçao again in 2025 as part of another SFU international field school to dive deeper into how humans have transformed the island throughout time and the lessons we can learn for future conservation efforts. So really cool. So um, yeah, awesome. I like Curaçao. Uh, my boyfriend has to go to Curaçao at least once or twice a year. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> because he's in the Navy and he has to go there for work. Um, so, yeah, I've never been there, probably never will go there. Not really sure I'm interested in flying for like nine hours, nearly ten hours. Nah. Um, so, next article. 
because I almost have to leave. 11,000 year old stone ornaments indicate early body perforation. Stone personal ornaments found in 11,000 year old burials provide the earliest evidence of body perforation in Southwest Asia. Archaeologists have uncovered 100 earring-like ornaments in 11,000-year-old adult burials at the early Neolithic site of Bunkuklu Tarla in Turkey. According to a new study published in the journal Antiquity, the ornaments were used for body perforation and also suggest that they were used in coming-of-age rituals for young adults. Bunkuklu Tarla, for those who might not know, is possibly the oldest settlement in the world. I've covered Bonkuklu Tarla, uh, I've mentioned it at least a, a few times. It's uh, incredible, it's amazing, um, probably we'll do a video on it once. One, one sometime in the future. According to uh, the ornaments were discovered in situ next to the ears and chains of the skeletal remains and are mostly made from limestone, obsidian or river pebbles. The diversity of the ornaments indicate that they were crafted for use in both ear and lower lip piercings known as labrets. This is supported by a skeletal analysis of the remains revealing wear patterns on the lower incisors consistent with historical and contemporary instances of labret wearing in different cultures. According to the study authors, further examination of the skeletons found that both males and females had piercings, but they were exclusively worn by adults. Now, none of the child burials had any evidence of these ornaments. This suggests that piercings served not only aesthetic purposes, but also held social significance. It is probable that they served as a rite of passage, symbolizing an individual's transition into adulthood. According to Dr. Baisal, associate professor at Ankara University, it shows that traditions are still very much part of our lives today, were already developed at the important transitional time when people first started to settle in permanent villages in Western Asia more than 10,000 years ago. They had very complex ornamentation practices involving beads, bracelets, and pendants, including a very highly developed symbolic world, which was all expressed through the medium of the human body. So this is really cool, really cool stuff. Uh, yeah, here we can see some of the things they found. Awesome, awesome. So next, uh, close. Pyramidal structures uncovered at Los Teteles de Avila Castillo. Archeologists from the National Institute of Anthropology and History and the uh, INAH Puebla Center have uncovered several pyramidal structures at the Los Teteles de Avila Castillo archaeological site. Tetelictic, or Los Cerritos, as it is known locally, is located in the municipality of Teteles de Avila Castillo in Mexico, state of Puebla. And my pronunciation of things might absolutely be shitty, and I'm sorry, my grandest, greatest apologies, but it's on the spot. The site is more than 3,000 years old and dates from the late middle formative period, uh, 600 BC. According to a press announcement by the INAH, Tetelectic was a place of pilgrimage for people from the Sierra Norte area who later emigrated to around Teotihuacan, Cantona or Cholula. Following a series of research projects since 2014, the site have been revealed the site has been revealed to be a large ceremonial complex covering an area of 7.4 acres. Archaeologists theorize that the Tetelictic may have served as an astronomical observatory to record the agricultural cycle as the entire urban complex appears to be aligned with mountain ranges from the surrounding landscape. The largest structure, designated structure one, also has an alignment with Canopus, the brightest star in the southern constellation of Carina. The latest excavations have been conducted in response to both erosion and the structures being robbed by locals for construction materials. This has led to three py pyramidal structures being uncovered, accompanied with charred ceramics, polished lithics and carved objects made from obsidian and basalt. Experts suggest that the obsidian flakes found throughout the Telectic are indicative of um, an obsidian lithic industry for the manufacturing of products and weapons. Mario Castro Jimenez, president of the Tsongkoyoto Civil Association said, the following seasons, we will focus on knowing the construction and architectural system of the pyramidal bases. 
the archaeological site will remain closed to the public until the corresponding authorities determine otherwise. And now we have reached the last of our, uh, yeah, articles. Gosh darn it, them cats. Why do the cats always make sure that their hairs touch my nose right before live stream? Like, this is the second or third time that this has happened. It's annoying. Archaeologists find an assemblage of petroglyphs alongside dinosaur tracks in Brazil. This doesn't mean that people and dinosaurs lived at the same time. It means that the people who made these petroglyphs stumbled upon the dinosaur tracks as well. And they were probably amazed by it, which is why they left the petroglyphs. Okay. Just that to like quickly say that because uh, people are annoying sometimes. A study of the Cerroto de Letrero site, meaning signpost, hill in Brazil's Paraiba state, has led to the discovery of an assemblage of petroglyphs alongside dinosaur tracks. The Cerroto de, Let uh, Le the Cerrote de Letrero site has three rock outcrops of covering an area of 15,000 square meters. The site is situated in the Valle dos Dinosaurus Natural Monument, known as Dinosaur Valley, located on the periphery of the Susa Basin in the Susa Municipality. A recent study published in the journal Scientific Reports revealed that the outcrops have fossilized footprints from the early Cretaceous period, left behind by theropods, sauropods, and iguanodontian dinosaurs. The earliest mention of dinosaur tracks from the Susa region date back to the early 20th century with the first paleontolo paleontological study conducted in 1975. A later publication in 1979 gave reference to the existence of petroglyphs, referred to as Kariri Indian carvings. However, no further investigations were carried out to document the findings. Mm -hmm. In a recent study at Cerrote de Lotrero, archaeologists have found a series of petroglyphs alongside the dinosaur tracks, which, according to the researchers, are mainly characterized by circular motifs similar to petroglyphs found in the state of Paraiba and Rio Grande del Norte. Here you can see the petroglyphs. The petroglyphs have been described as low-relief geometric circles filled with radial lines, which were created by carving an abrasive instrument against the, against the rock surface. According to the study authors, despite the profusion of identified petroglyphs, no overlap was observed between the inscription and the fossilized footprints. In none of the cases was it found that the creation of a petroglyph resulted in damage to the existing footprints, suggesting thoughtfulness by the makers. Like I said, they probably stumbled upon the dinosaur remains and they were amazed by the fact that they were there and it would probably be seen as something sacred or holy or whatever you want to call that, uh, as very important at least, and therefore they created their petroglyphs. Archaeologists have determined that the petroglyphs belong to a broad set of motifs, either pure or abstract, and of similar or identical execution techniques found in other archaeological rock art sites in the Brazilian Northeast region. Based on radiocarbon dating of burials found at these associated sites, the researchers suggest that the petroglyphs date from a period spanning 9,426, 20 years before present. So that's years ago. All right. Uh, further research utilizing new methods of direct dating of petroglyphs such as X-ray fluorescence spectrometry, spectrometry, what a fun word, such as X-ray fluorescence spectrometry will certainly shed light on the chronology on the chronology issue. In the absence of applying absolute dating methods to the petroglyphs, the proposed dating here remains restricted to iconographic references as well as extrapolation from the temporal horizons identified in the few dated sites in the region, said the study authors. So that was the last I had for you. I'm going to show you this once again. Uh, I can see that I have to go right about now, <laughs> like actually about a minute ago, but it's fine. Uh, we are here. Oh, yeah, before present is around 1950. But still, it's like, <laughs> kind of like before now, because it's not like more than a hundred years ago. It's fine. Uh, it's fun. I did this. Uh, we all did this. We were all here. This was cool. But um, I have to leave. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, we went on for nearly two hours. So yay. It's not a record, but it's cool. Um... 
I hope everyone will have a wonderful day and a wonderful night. Um, thank you for joining and uh, feel free to support me using uh, historywithkaylee.live. Um, yeah, become a channel member, become a Patreon. Uh, the links are all in the description uh, of this uh, live stream. Thank you all for joining me and I'll see you in the next video. The next video will be on the Bosnian pyramids. Are they a hoax? Are they just mountains? Or are they the oldest pyramids ever created by humans? We will see. Okay, bye.